spend about 70 hours a week talking about pickles, trying pickles, thinking about pickles, figuring out what to pickle. You know, embarrassingly, that's a lot more time than I spend on anything else in my life. We have a, a sign outside the shop that says pickle shop. And you get a lot of people wandering in and they say, you know, do you have any pickles? And I say, of course we have pickles. We have all sorts of pickles, but you want pickled turnips, you want pickled carrots, you know, you want a, a pickled celery drink. What, what would you like? And they're like, you know, pickles. I want a pickle. I think to really define a pickle, I really love the, the Japanese definition. The Japanese word for pickle is sukumono. And um, what that literally translates as is to alter without the use of heat. Basically, the salt will draw the juice out of the vegetables, that brine will sour over time, and you have a lactic acid pickle. Um, that would be cucumbers, that would be sauerkraut, that would be kimchi. Modern industrial pickling has really sort of become a, a sad industry in which you have vegetables um, that you pour boiling vinegar over and you keep pasteurize them and they sit on a shelf indefinitely. It has none of the sort of vibrant microbial activity and the really alive zinginess that a naturally fermented pickle would have. If people could only know one thing about pickles, a pickle is more than a sour cucumber. Pickles are entirely a food group onto their own that have thousands of years of culinary tradition and benefits to people's digestion and you know flavor additions to their diet. And it's such a huge world to explore and I am just, just scratching the surface. Everything I do is naturally fermented. Um, we don't use vinegar at all in our pickling, which surprises people. Using vinegar, I mean, it's, it's a shortcut. It's, it's almost more like a, a marinade than a sort of alchemical process. We'd use a really high-grade sea salt. The first thing that the salt does is it draws the juice out of vegetables, and that's huge um, because you cannot pickle a dry vegetable. It would mold. Um, so the salt draws the juice out and it creates a brine. The bottom there is cabbage and beets and carrots. It's entirely covered in liquid right now. And that's because yesterday we mixed it in in the morning and we let it sit and we let it sweat. And then in the afternoon we came back and we like to call it massaging, but it's sort of a kneading, almost like kneading bread. And that really works as much juice out of the vegetable as you can. And so that will become its, its brine. So the heart of the whole business really lies here in the cave, which is a cool room where everything sits and sours. Different vegetables will, will sit in here for different amounts of time. The, the sauerkraut, which is in what most of these larger ones, will sit in here for an average of six to eight weeks. If you come over here to something that was made, see, three days ago, it's kind of in its, its peak of the sugars of the vegetables being eaten releasing carbon dioxide. You can notice all of this bubbling right here. Sometimes when it's bubbling to this extent, it'll actually blow the top right off. It'll be kind of like up on its side or turned over and there'll usually be a puddle and it'll be a big mess. Um, <laughs> if it's nearing completion, I will at that point probably take it apart and try it so that as I'm doing my scheduling, I can know that this will get packed, you know, this week or next week or the week after. I can taste pH to, you know, a tenth of a degree, pretty accurately. You know, everyone needs salt. You would die without salt. Um, there are definitely people on salt-restricted diets, and this is not a low-sodium product. If people were to cut out the vast majority of processed foods that they eat, you know, that right there would be, you know, I think one of their huge problems. We do use a really high grade sea salt um, and it is the salty part of your meal. You could certainly eat without salt and eat pickled vegetables on it and like you'd be doing great. So the salt doesn't freak me out at all.
part of, I think, pickling well is sort of understanding your palate. And I like to think that everything we do is really beautiful. These were purple carrots. And you can't tell really so much now that they were purple carrots. They look really orange. But you can see that the brine is this really beautiful, rich, ruby color. Salt tends to make vegetables bleed out their color. And so sometimes you pickle something and it's like, whoa, what is that going to bleed to? Like right now in the cave, I have some red mustard that's pickling with some turmeric. And like, what's going to win there? And what, what color is that going to turn? These were Tokyo turnips. It's a kimchi, so it's spicy with garlic and ginger. And, you know, the cayenne gives it that beautiful sort of, you know, sunset orange brine. These is the kasu. So the, the white in here is what is filtered out of the sake making process. And we mix it with salt and sugar. And we kind of knead it until it's almost like a bread dough. And then we embed these carrots in it. This is a beet daikon pickle. It's, it's spiced with coriander seed and green peppercorns. It's actually really difficult to tell what is the beet and what is the daikon, um, because actually the beets just totally, completely overtake everything. In the sauerkrauts, we do one called a vintage kraut, which is, it, it's very sort of classic Eastern Europe sauerkraut. It has caraway and juniper and apple. We do one called a sea kraut. It's a very popular one. It has three different types of seaweed and burdock and ginger. I like it a lot. It's a really friendly way to get your seaweed and certainly no one eats enough seaweed. Today we're going to be putting into jars Tokyo turnip, which is a small white turnip. Um, maintains its texture really well in pickling. And we've mixed it with maitake mushrooms and spring onions and matcha, which is the powder made from a very young green tea leaf. Um, that's a very beautiful one. Nothing lasts forever that isn't full of a lot of crap. However, they're stable, you know, they're salty and acidic. Once they're at the point where I sell them, they should stay refrigerated because refrigeration does slow down the natural fermentation that will continue to occur in a live product. They won't go bad in sort of our standard way of thinking about how things go bad but they will change. They will become sort of overripe tasting, like just over sort of fizzy tasting. They will lose some colors and texture. In the fridge, I think they easily last for six months. One really fascinating pickle that I've just gotten into is we have started nuka pickling, another Japanese tradition. You're actually creating a pickling bed and it takes several weeks to establish that pickling bed even before you put anything in there that you would eat. You're almost creating like a pickling oven. We take rice bran, we mixed it with salt and seaweed and water, and we stirred it up until it was sort of a paste. Every day you wanna stir it, and every day you wanna put some sort of vegetable scrap in it. You're not gonna eat any of these, but you would put a carrot top or an onion skin or, or anything like that, and you would bury it, and then the next day when you were stirring it, you would take that scrap out and you would put a new scrap in. And the idea is, is that after several weeks of this activity, that the bed becomes so microbially rich that you could put something in there and it would pickle in a day. That's kind of crazy. People ask me, is it hard? No, it's not hard. It's like very, very basic. However, there are a lot of things you need to know. You're going for color, you're going for texture, you're going for balance. People ask me if they can pickle without salt, and that's absurd. And some people do, I prefer to call it composting. When you're pickling at home, you will sometimes get some molds or some yeast that form on the surface. You know, it's contact with oxygen, that's what happens. In general, if you're attentive, um, that those can be scraped off and anything below that was not in contact with oxygen will be fine. You know, trust your senses. It's, it's food. You've, you've lived around food your whole life. Like, you know when something shouldn't be eaten. My biggest advice to people is to record their data. You know, people are like, oh, I made some sauerkraut. Once it was fine, like, the next time it was awful. And it was like, well, did you write down, you know, like, how much salt you used? Did you measure your salt? No. You know, did you write down how long you let it go or what temperature the room was or, you know, what you used? No. If you want to sort of constantly improve upon what you're doing and, and learn from your experience, you know, keep a log and keep going back and figure it out.
A good rule of thumb is if you can eat it raw, you could probably try pickling it. Just because you can pickle it, it doesn't also necessarily mean it's going to be great. Um, there are things that I do that I toss. Eggplant's tricky. That's hard. God, but the Japanese, again, like, they do pickle eggplant. I tried doing eggplant in the sake dregs and that was awful. Beets have a lot of sugar. And so the juice of a beet is almost, you know, is more like a syrup than a juice. So you will end up with this crazy viscous tar of a brine. Kind of amazing, kind of weird. So what we try to do when we pickle our beets is actually add a lot of brine from other vegetables along with it and that will kind of thin it out. I'm doing some blood oranges right now. I'm not quite sure what I think of them yet. Kombucha is a beverage. It's different than a pickle. It's, it's not a wild ferment. You actually need a kombucha culture to start it. The kombucha culture are these very crazy alien looking jellyfish blobs. It eats tea and sugar and it eats that tea and sugar and it metabolizes it into this bubbly kind of tangy beverage. Um, so very probiotically rich, has a really wide spectrum of probiotic bacteria. You know, there's still a little caffeine from the tea, so it's definitely sort of an invigorating drink as well. If you let it go too long, I think it tastes like vinegar and it's pretty gross. The difference in the way that we do it is we juice vegetables and we add it to our kombucha. We put it in the bottle with vegetable juices. We add a very small amount of a raw local honey, so that's sort of our priming sugar. And then we cap it off and we let it sit for about another week or so to let it carbonate, and then it's ready to go. We call it a vegetable soda, a naturally fermented vegetable soda, and you know, I sort of love that concept. For breakfast, I might put some pickled turnip on my toast with any sort of various nut butter. Um, for lunch, I would mix uh, you know, a pickled beet into my salad. And for dinner, I would eat you know, some pickled daikon along with my rice and tofu. And you'd probably want to have a kombucha in there as like your sort of afternoon pick-me-up, I think. But I really try to think of it as its own food group. Think of it as the high note of your, of your meal, like what adds the zing, what adds the zest, what sort of adds the pow.